Passion can be defined as an inclination or a desire to do something you like or you think is important. The Spanish poet and theater director Frederico Garcia Lorca used the word duende, which means life force, to signify a deep passion within you. So here's the question I have for all of us as we begin this morning. How can people start believing that their lives are worth living? There's so many hopeless people in the world, and so I ask the question, how can people start believing that their lives are worth living? Figuring out our passion is one way of doing that, and living our life on purpose to fulfill that passion is another way. Keep that thought in the back of your mind as you open your Bibles with me to the Gospel of Mark as we continue in that verse-by-verse -verse study. Last time we were in Mark, remember how Jesus retreated up on a mountain and he called his apostles to himself and put the call in their life, come follow me. And he gave the apostles some specific credentials and powers in order to do their ministry. These men, every one of them were nobodies and misfits. But once filled with the Holy Spirit, they turned the world upside down with the gospel of Christ. And God didn't call them because of who they were. He called them in spite of who they were. We learned that now, once we're a Christian, God has a specific call for each of us as well. And like I said last time, if you are in Christ, good news. He is not done with you yet. And so today is kind of a unique passage where Jesus' own people believe that he's wasting his entire life when in fact he was living out his life for his master passion, fulfilling the will of the Father. And his own family and his own people believe he's just wasting his time and then he's going to be accused of so many things as well. So if you have your sermon notes, Roman numeral one, Jesus' family misunderstands. If your Bibles are open, Mark chapter 3, we're going to begin at verse 20. The Gospel of Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. Now, you may remember last time we ended at verse 19, and verse 19 says the apostles and Jesus went back to a house. And so immediately following the calling of the 12 apostles, Jesus is back at a house again, and he's going to teach, and this large crowd shows up once again. In fact, the crowd is so big, they can't even eat bread or do anything else. There's not enough room to do anything. And so this huge crowd shows up, and they're all needy people. And here Jesus is again, and he's not going to let these needy people just go on with their needs. He's going to meet their needs. And in the eyes of others, Jesus is failing to take care of himself. He's not living a normal life. You ever been accused of that? You're not living for yourself. And because Jesus isn't eating regular, he's not resting regular, and his people are scared, he's out of his mind, and he's not living a normal life. Remember, Joseph had a carpentry business. And so many people would think, you know, Jesus, you could just take over that carpentry business, make a good living for yourself, you know, take care of your family, get married, have a couple of kids, settle down. Why are you doing what you're doing? So notice what happens. Look again at verse 21. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him, for they said he was out of his mind. He was out of his mind. Some of the other versions, let me give you the New Living Translation version of verse 21. It says, when his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him home with them. He is out of his mind, they said. So at the end of Mark chapter 3, we're going to see again where Jesus' mom and brothers show up. And they're going to try and force Jesus, come home and get some rest. Come home and take a break. Because Jesus' own family doesn't understand his ministry at all. They don't understand who he is. They don't understand the call in his life. And they're saying, you got to come get some rest. This is what Warren Wiersbe said about that. Our Lord's friends were sure that Jesus was confused, and some even said he was deranged. 
The great crowds they saw following him and the amazing reports that they heard about him convinced that he was desperately in need of help. There in your notes, he simply was not living a normal life. So his friends came to Capernaum to lay hold of him or to take charge of him. You see, they didn't just come and say, hey, Jesus, how about taking a break? You look a little tired. You know, you're kind of worn out. Why don't you come home with us? No, that's not what they did. Here in the passage, it says lay hold of him. Those words in the Greek mean to arrest or seize or take possession of against his will. They were going to lay hold of him and drag him home, whether he wanted to rest or not. They're going to forcibly take control of Jesus. William Lane said this. The word Mark uses here carries the sense of derangement. There in your notes. Jesus appeared to be crazy because he was doing and saying the things that put him in direct opposition to the most powerful people in Israel at that time. Not to mention that he's doing all these things, but he also chose 12 of the worst men he could think of. And they got to be thinking, come on, not only are you crazy, but look at your followers. You could have chosen anybody and you chose these misfits and you're not eating regular, you're not resting regular. And so you're out of your mind. You know, throughout history, God's servants have been misjudged all over the place. Think about this. You mean to tell me you're following a God that you've never seen? A God that you can't audibly hear? What kind of nut are you? I mean, think about this. If you run for public office today and they say, do you believe in the God of heaven? And you say, yes, I absolutely believe in the God of heaven. They're going to call you a kook. You're a nut. You believe in a God you can't see? You believe in a God you can't hear? What kind of nut are you? Dwight Moody, when he was in ministry, they called him Crazy Moody because he followed the Lord so much. Even the Apostle Paul was called a madman in the book of Acts. You know, when I first gave my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you may not know this about me, but I am, I'm a dog on a bone. If I'm passionate about something, I'm all in. I am not a halfway guy. I am all or nothing. And so when I first gave my life to the Lord, there were many of our family members who thought, this guy's out of his mind. I went from a punk in high school, a real punk, and I'll let you, your mind go there because, yes, that kind of punk. I went from a real punk in high school to a Jesus freak overnight. I lost a lot of friends. I lost a lot of people because they were like, this guy is nuts. He's certifiable. We ought to lay hold of him. Even my favorite aunt, who I was like a son to, disowned me because I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. Here's the truth, and this is something you can hold on to. If my friends and my family acknowledge that Jesus was real and that he changed my life, they would have to do something with this Jesus Christ. They'd have to do something for themselves because, you see, with Jesus, there's no middle ground. Either you're a follower or you're an enemy. There's no middle ground. And Jesus is the most divisive figure in all of history. You know, so many people want to say Jesus is love, and that's true. He is, absolutely. But he is divisive because he proclaims there's only one way. There are a lot of other world religions who would say, you know, this religion can get along with this religion, and you just do you, and we'll do us. But Jesus says, no, there's one way. And if you're not following this way, then you're not saved. And so he's divisive. Everywhere he went, Jesus brought division. Yes, he brought salvation. Yes, he brought healing. Yes, he brought love and compassion. But he brought division as well. At his birth, Simeon prophesied this at his birth in Luke 2.34. This child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel. You see, let me give you some bad news this morning. If a person passively sits back and makes no decision for Jesus, they are actually making a decision to be an enemy of Jesus. Jesus himself said in Matthew 12, 30, he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. He also said in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's so divisive. You mean to tell me there's only one way? That's right, there's only one way. 
There in your notes, G. Campbell Morgan has said, only two forces are at work in the world, the gathering and the scattering. Whoever does one contradicts the other. So here's the deal. Either Jesus was completely crazy and out of his mind, or Jesus was who he said he was, and he is Lord. And if he is Lord, then we must submit to his leading. There, there's no other way. And again, to make no decision is to make a decision to deny him. And if you make a decision to deny him, there are eternal consequences that come with that decision. This is why Jesus himself said, first, count the cost. Then pick up your cross and follow me. Don't just, okay, I'm in, I'm in. No, 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 count the cost. Because there is a cost to following him. You see, when Jesus Christ becomes so real to you, where you know that you know that you know that he is who he said he is, you can't help but follow him with all your heart. And it's going to seem so strange to everyone around you. You go from being a rebellious punk to a Jesus freak overnight, people will stop talking to you. And so Jesus' family misunderstands, thinks he's crazy, but he is the long-awaited Messiah who came to save his people from their sins. So then the religious leaders have to come, and they've got to put their two cents in. Number two there in your notes, a divided house. Look at verse 22. It says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he cast out demons. So he called to them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he can plunder his house. So the scribes, just so you know who these guys are, these guys were professional experts in the law. This is a guy you would go to if you wanted a marriage contract or you were buying real estate, you needed something drawn up. These guys were experts in the law and they would draw up these contracts. They often align themselves with the Pharisees, who we've met several times now. And the Pharisees were non-professional leaders of the synagogue. That's who they were. They interpreted the law and the traditions of their fathers. So you have these professional guys who are professional people in the law, writing these contracts and everything else. And they come down from Jerusalem because they heard of these miracles. And they heard of the healings and the crowds and all these different things of this guy named Jesus. And they've come to put a stop to it. Enough is enough. And their accusation against Jesus is that he's demon-possessed. And that his miracles actually come from the ruler of the demons, which is crazy. There in your notes, catch this. Because these religious leaders could not deny the miracles of Jesus, they attributed his power to the working of Satan. And notice that Jesus knows their thoughts. Here again, he can read their thoughts. I love that. They haven't asked a question. And he says, I know your thoughts. And, and this is more than discernment. This is Almighty God who knows what you're thinking. And they go to do this and he says, here's what's going to happen. I know the intents of your heart. I know your thoughts. Psalms 94, 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of men. He knows them. So Jesus calls and he speaks to them in parables. And I've often wondered why. Why not just tell them plainly? Look, dirtbags, here's the deal. No, no, no. He speaks to them in parables. In parables, Jesus would speak to the crowds, something they were familiar with here on earth, to teach them a kingdom truth. That's what he would do. And so he points out this logical conclusion. Let's get logical here for a minute, folks. It makes no sense for Satan to cast himself out. Because if he did, then his kingdom would not stand. In Matthew's account, I love what Jesus does there. Jesus asks them during this same account in Matthew, Hey, 
how do your exorcists uh, cast out demons? You're, you're accusing me of doing it by demonic power. How do your people do it? Matthew 12, 27. If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. Beelzebub is the Lord of the flies, or the Lord of dung, God of dung. It's another name for Satan. And he's first seen as a false god of the Philistines in 2 Kings in the Old Testament. The Expositor's Bible Commentary said, They wouldn't say that Jesus was possessed by just any old demon, but by Satan himself. There in your notes. This was an involuntary compliment to the exceptional power and greatness of Jesus. In other words, you don't just have some little demon... You are empowered by the head of demons. The miracles are too great. And so first, Jesus' own family misunderstands him. And then these scribes who hold all this power in Israel come down and try to discredit Jesus, saying that your working is through Satan. And their hatred of Jesus is so deep that they accuse him of using demonic power to get rid of demonic power. And you just got to scratch your head. And so Jesus kind of has this battle of wits with them. But they came unarmed. And so he asked, how can Satan cast out Satan? Is Satan at war with himself? Am I working with the power of Satan and wouldn't Satan defeat himself? Because a house divided cannot stand. It simply means that if Satan's fighting himself, he's never going to win. But then notice what he says. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods. 1 John 5.19 tells us that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world is his house, basically. But Jesus is mightier than Satan. GotQuestions.org said this. Before Satan allows his dominion to be plundered, He must be incapacitated. Jesus was not in league with Satan, as the scribes suggested. Jesus had come to earth to what was essentially Satan's house in order to bind Satan and plunder his goods, which are the souls of men. That's what Jesus came, to plunder his goods, steal back souls. There in your notes, today... The powers of darkness seem so powerful, but it's important to realize that Satan has already been defeated. If you are in Christ, there is no part of your life that has to stay under the dominion of Satan. Not one little part. If you're in Christ, you've been set free. Free indeed. And most of us fail to understand that. And so here's the question. Where did Jesus conquer Satan? How did Jesus bind the strong man? Colossians 2.15 Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. The all-powerful, sinless, creator God come in the flesh, allowed sinful man to lead him in chains. The one who spoke the very world into existence and even right now holds every molecule together by the power of him allowed sinful man to brutalize him and fasten his hands and feet to a Roman cross with iron spikes. And what appeared to be the ultimate display of weakness, something magnificent happened on the cross. And on the third day, when Jesus rose up, you can't keep a good man down. So after speaking this parable, Jesus makes a statement about his family's unbelief and the hostile scribes as well. Roman numeral three, the unpardonable sin. The unpardonable sin. Look at verse 28. Jesus' words in red, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, All sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation, because they said he has an unclean spirit. So according to Jesus here, 
The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, also known as the unpardonable or unforgivable sin, is unique. Okay? The, hang on to this one. Because I can't tell you the amount of people, since I've been in ministry, who have come to me and said, I think I committed the unpardonable sin. Let me just tell you right out of the gate. If that question is in your mind, good news, you have not. Okay? There it is. If you're worried that you've committed it, you have not. Because if you've committed it, you wouldn't be worried about it. But the scribes accused the perfect, sinless Lamb of God of being evil and demon-possessed. And he warned the religious leaders, look, your rejection of me is going to cost you for eternity. Because you are completely rejecting the work of the Holy Spirit. They're saying that Jesus performed these miracles by the power of Satan, and by doing that, they were committing the unpardonable sin. There in your notes, the Holy Spirit's ministry is to testify of Jesus. So he is warning these leaders that they were committing the unforgivable sin. John 15, 26 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, Catch this, he will testify of me, Jesus said. That's his job. He will testify of me. The Holy Spirit's job is to point you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit has many functions, but his main function is to testify of Jesus. So when someone rejects the testimony of the Holy Spirit, that's open blasphemy. By rejecting the teaching and witness of the Spirit, you're calling the Holy Spirit a liar. G. Campbell Morgan said this, The sin against the Holy Spirit is the ultimate refusal to believe on the testimony of the Spirit concerning Christ. The sin against the Holy Spirit is the persistent, determined, and final rejection of the Spirit's demonstration of the meaning of the kingdom and of the power of the king. Again, so many people think that, you know, I've done this certain sin, and God's never going to forgive me of that, you know. I mean, I look in the Bible, and, you know, I've committed murder, I've committed this, i committed that, i committed this. And, you know, James 2.10 said, If you kept the whole law perfectly, and yet stumbled at one point, you're guilty of all. So ask yourself this morning, folks, which one are you not guilty of? But the power of the blood of Jesus Christ would tell you, James 4.8, Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Many sincere people have somehow thought that whatever sin they've done, I've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you know, a thought comes in your mind, and all of a sudden you're like, Oh my gosh, I just cursed the Holy Spirit. Oh, oh, what am I going to do? Again, if you're worried about it, good news. You haven't committed it. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit was a specific sin the Pharisees and scribes did there that day. It cannot be duplicated today. There in your notes, Jesus Christ is no longer on earth physically, so no one can personally see Jesus perform a miracle and attribute that power to Satan instead of the Holy Spirit. The only time a person commits the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is if a person dies without accepting the free gift of Christ. If you show up in eternity without ever accepting the free gift of Jesus Christ, you have committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, and that's bad news. It's a dangerous thing to sit in church and hear the gospel week after week after week and reject it. It's such a dangerous thing to see and get the inoculation of the gospel. That's what a lot of us get is the inoculation. I've got this much of the gospel that I don't want the real thing. And you sit here week after week after week and you hear about the gospel and reject it. And pretty soon you grow hard hearted. And I've got enough of it. Thank you. I got mine. There in your notes, the only unpardonable sin today is committed when a person dies in unbelief and refuses to accept Jesus' free gift of salvation by grace through faith. There's no pardon for that person. Roman numeral four. The plea of the family, look at verse 31. 
Then his brothers and his mother came, and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him, and they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. There in your notes, again, Jesus' own family was convinced that he was crazy. So they came with the sole purpose of forcibly seizing him to take him back to Nazareth. You know, Mark here in his gospel clearly teaches us the earliest opinions of what the people thought of Jesus who were going to reject him. The unbelieving world did not believe he was God the Son, the Messiah. And those closest to him misunderstand him so much. And so they're going to come and take him by force because he's insane. And, and so Jesus asked, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? You know, you would think that Jesus' family would have a special place or special privileges within his ministry. But later, before his death in John 7, 5, we're told this. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Uh, imagine this. You grew up with this guy. You grew up with this guy. This is the Jesus that was always perfect. Always took out the trash on time. Always did what mom wanted. Here's the perfect son. You know, he's the golden child. And so now all of a sudden they're like, Messiah? No, this is the guy I grew up with. And even his own brothers until after his resurrection did not believe in him. And, and so, again, Jesus is at this house. He's teaching. And his physical family so worried they show up. And what Jesus is informing his disciples there is, yes, earthly relationships are important. But spiritual relationships are those that are going to last for eternity. From then on, Jesus is going to be focused on those who would receive his free gift. The earthly relationships in his mind were done. Now, we could go into talking about how some religions believe that Mary stayed a virgin until she died and all that stuff. But very clearly here, he had brothers. And in fact, according to the expositor's commentary, the MSS manuscripts add sisters as well. He had brothers and sisters. So when Jesus said, whoever does the will of God as my brother and my sister and my mother, he wasn't disrespecting his mom. You've got to understand that, right? God doesn't contradict God. And God wants us to respect our parents. But what he's saying is, my life passion is to do the will of my father and no other relationship on planet Earth is going to get in the way of that. What a tough lesson for us. You know, I hear these young people dating someone and, you know, they're flirting to convert, you know, or missionary dating, some people call it, right? No, he's not a Christian, but I'm going to bring him to church. And of course, he's going to become a Christian and they marry this guy. And 10 years later, they're like, why doesn't he serve the Lord? No other relationship is going to get in the way of me serving Jesus. Period. and a sentence. There in your notes. So Jesus is communicating that as he is fulfilling the will of the Father, his spiritual family and spiritual matters take precedence over fleshly interests. You know, someone came to Jesus and asked this question out of John 6, and what an important question. What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work, singular, of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. What works do we got to do? Just one. Believe. And by believing, by the way, if you truly believe, it will change your life. And so Mark 3 is communicating the religious leaders were in danger of damnation. And then Jesus contrasts that, and this is what's so cool about our God. He contrasts the fact that these religious leaders were in danger of damnation, and he contrasts that by offering you a relationship with him that will last eternity. You see what they're doing? But I came to give you eternal life. There's the invitation. 
to be part of his family. So let's get practical this morning. Again, Jesus, his family, and the religious leaders misunderstand him, and they misunderstand his passion to do the will of the Father. C.H. Spurgeon said this, He who believes in Christ, finding himself completely pardoned as a result of his faith in the precious blood of Christ, loves Christ and loves the God who gave Christ to be the redemption. That love becomes a master passion in your life. So the main thing I'd like to focus on as we conclude is having the call of Jesus in your life be your master passion. Spurgeon also said, Do not rest until love and faith in Christ are the master passion of your soul. Don't rest until that's the master passion of your soul. And again, passion can be defined as an inclination or a desire to do something you like or you think is important. How does a person conclude that this life is worth living? Suicide rates are up so, so stinking high. And as someone who has suffered from a f- close family member committing suicide when I was a young kid, I mean, it's, it's because there's no hope. Suicide is up so high because there's no hope. And without Jesus Christ, we live in a hopeless world. This world has no hope. And so figuring out our passion and then living on purpose for that passion is what gives us hope. You know, when I gave up our career, we owned a wholesale business. And when I decided I'm selling it, going to Bible college, four kids in tow, giving up the security of the world to go serve the Lord, I had people call me not only insane, that was the nicest thing they called me, but I knew that I knew that I knew God had called me to something. And if you know that God has called you to something, no matter what the world says, you will never be fulfilled until you answer that call. I guarantee it. You know, last week we learned how Jesus called himself the Good Shepherd in the Gospel of John. Just before he called himself the Good Shepherd, these are the words of Christ in John 10.10. He said, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Satan has come to steal from you. But I came to give you abundant life. And the abundant life is offered to all who would place their faith in Jesus Christ. But you know what I found out in ministry? A lot of us leave it sitting there. And and we chase the things of the world rather than chasing the abundant life, which is truly a life worth living. We will never truly live the abundant life until we fully understand who we are in Christ our new identity, the new life, that our past has been forgiven. I'm no longer that person. The abundant life happens when you passionately serve the king. And all of a sudden you think that you're working, you think that you're doing something to earn favor, and you find out that as you're fulfilling your passion, you're actually getting more than you're giving because you're starting to experience the abundant life that comes from knowing him and living for the creator God of the universe. Paul said in the book of Romans, Romans 125, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen. Idolatry happens when we put anything or anybody at the center of our life rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. The center of our affection is anything but Jesus that's called idolatry. And let me tell you, that will take you places you never want to go. Timothy Keller said, Since we were made, we were created to worship, we cannot eliminate God out of our lives unless we take on a God substitute. There are consequences to eliminating God as the object of our worship and replacing him with substitutes. You see, when you choose not to worship Yahweh, the true and living God, you automatically, you were created, it's in your DNA, to worship something or somebody. 
So if you take Jesus out of the center of your life, you will worship someone. C.S. Lewis said, Human history is the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. You see, the Lord saves and washes and renews us, and he makes us into vessels intended to worship him. That's what he does when he saves us. Before Christ, we were wrecked by our own sin. We were wrecked by the strong man of the world. We were wrecked by all these different things. But Jesus wonderfully saved and washed and made us brand new to serve him and enjoy him forever. Paul Tripp said, God is the center of his universe. And when you put yourself there, it only ends in brokenness and disappointment. God loves you too much to be willing to forsake his glorious kingdom for you to have a kingdom of self. There in your notes, here's the take home, folks. The fulfilled, abundant, joy-filled life is only possible when we start with Jesus at the center of our universe and as our master passion. I'm going to give you a promise this morning. Write this down somewhere, and when we all get to heaven, you can come and tell me I'm wrong. Not a one of us will get to heaven and wish we had done more for our earthly kingdom. Not a one of us will. Not a one of us will get to heaven and wish we did more for self here. Gee, I just wish I would have just a little bit more. When we realize who Jesus is, that he is who he said he is, and the lengths that he went to save a wretch like me, it will become such a master passion within your life to serve the King of Kings because you can't help it. You'll get a bad case of can't help it. It's because he loves you. And when that truth is known, really known, that you know, that you know, that you know how much he loves you and who he is and who you are, being passionate about Jesus is so easy. It is so easy. I'm going to ask the worship team to come on up. And every week, we have people in the back who would love to pray for you. We really count it a joy to just pray with our people. And if there's something in your heart this morning you want to pray about or just share a blessing or any of that, we're in the back. We would love to talk to you. I'm going to pray, and then let's worship. Thank you for listening, and we hope that you are blessed. If you'd like to find out more info about our church or any other resources like sermon notes or things like that, you can check out our website at livingfaithclamath.com. Make sure if you haven't already to subscribe or like us on whatever your favorite podcast app is. You'll find us at Living Faith Fellowship Klamath Falls. Again, be blessed. Be blessed.